And I guess we'll get started. It's 3.02 by my clock. So I'll say welcome to everybody that's here. Oh, wow, we got a good amount of participants. So I'm happy to see that. Um, my name is Nicole Anist. I'm the curator at the Lamont Doherty Core Repository. Uh, we're part of Columbia University, uh, but we're in Palisades, New York, not in the city. Um, this is, well, welcome to the potentially inaugural uh, town hall of this sort for repositories and users of repositories to meet and get together. Uh, NSF asked us to put this together um, so that we could open the floodgates of communication with you all. Um, we keep getting the same questions from many users over the years. So we thought it was a good idea to reach out and let you all know exactly what we are capable of, what we have, um, more about us. And for you all to let us know what you want and need um, that we haven't been able to fulfill over the years. So we're going to start today with um, brief introductions uh, and from each of the four NSF funded repositories. So there are many more repositories than just us four, um, but we are the only four NSF funded ones currently. And that is myself at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. We have Oregon State University and their curators here, um, University of Rhode Island and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. <clears throat> so we're going to start with the four presentations. Um, then I'm going to bring up a couple of topics about publications, publishing, acknowledging us, that sort of thing. We're going to talk about pre-cruise, contacting us pre-cruise rather than post-cruise, um, if you want to store your samples with us. Uh, we'll talk about accessioning uh, samples from retiring researchers and professionals or anyone else who needs a place to store their valuable samples. Um, then we will talk about the survey, uh, take, main takeaways from the survey response, including um, I'll give you a quick tour and tutorial of the main database that we all share. And then we'll open the floor up for Q&A. All right. Um, so does anyone have any quick questions or anything uh, related to technical issues or any of that sort before we get started. Um, Nicole Dontremont from Woods Hole is going to help with your questions um, and the chat. So at the end of each segment, um, if there are any questions relating to that presentation or what we just talked about, we'll go over them then. Otherwise, more generalized questions will reserve to the end of, uh, of the talk, of the entire town hall. Um, so with that, I'll leave it open. Any questions, comments? Um, I think that was all I had for an introduction. Unless there's anything the other curators want to add at this time. This, okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to get started. Uh, talking about the repository at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, and then we'll move on from there. Oh, I'm gonna share my screen. All right. So here at the Lamont Doherty Core Repository, we have just over 20,000 samples. Uh, we have sediment cores as well as sediment grab samples. We have rock dredges. Uh, we have a somewhat new uh, coral collection, including cores and hand samples. Uh, and we also have a bunch of terrestrial cores from wetlands, mostly from wetlands. Uh, we have a few from old wetlands as well in South America. Uh, a couple of special collections like that. But uh, the majority of our collection um, is sediment cores, sediment cores, marine sediment cores. So our purpose and who are we? So our purpose is long-term curation of valuable geologic samples. 
mostly marine. Um, we're here also to, sit, to serve the community by fulfilling sample requests. We send out about 4,000 samples a year to researchers worldwide. Um, there's no charge for us sampling. Uh, in some cases, if it's a very large sample request, we might ask that people pick up at least part of the shipping costs. Um, but for the most part, it's entirely free. Um, <clears throat> we're here to assist investigators in planning a cruise. So that would mean contacting us beforehand or during the planning stages. And we also do a lot of outreach. We educate teachers, students, the public, um, whoever is interested. We do many outreach events off campus. Uh, and we have, before COVID obviously, we had a lot, we had thousands of people visiting the repository every year. And who we are, our staff is three people large. It's the director is Maureen Ramo. I am the curator and we have one lab technician named Cody Randall. Um, Cody Randall can be seen in the lower left picture there on top of some of our dredges, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the top left picture, this is our old core splitter. I don't want anyone to think we still use this. We have a, a more modernized core splitter than this. But we also bring in over the summers high school and undergraduate students to help out um, with various organizational and database entry tasks. So our cores um, are mostly, actually two thirds roughly of our collection are dry cores. So the Vima, the Conrad, um, we've been coring since the 1950s or late 1940s. And um, the cores were stored in these metal trays that you see on the left and allowed to dry out. Uh, but since 1984, everything has been kept wet in D tubes. Um, this is the normal way most of the repositories store sediment cores now. And this space was expanded. We opened up into another room in 2019. So we have maybe a decade's worth of expansion left for acquiring material. Our coral cores come from many collections, uh, people who have retired over the years, and they are now here. They are all cataloged in CESAR, uh, which I believe one of the other facilities will talk about briefly. Um, but if anyone's interested in coral cores or hand samples, we have these collections here, uh, mostly from Bermuda and the Bahamas, some from the South Pacific as well, some of the samples. And our dredge collection uh, also is global as well, you know, our cores are. Um, the circled groups are samples that are kept on campus. The majority of our dredges are kept off site uh, just because we didn't have the room here to keep them. And we have some lab facilities that are available to the community. Um, we have plenty of sediment washing. These are automated uh, washing stations. They can do eight samples at a time um, on the right here. Uh, we have setographs, we can do grain size analysis, pycnometers, coulometers, and we have the newest thing in this lab is an Olympus XRD benchtop analyzer, which is great in just a couple of hours and just like 12 milligrams of ground material, you can get fantastic XRD results. Uh, and additionally, we have uh, a Geotech multi-sensor track and an iTrax XRF core scanner. Um, the detector in our core scanner was upgraded in 2019, so it's the newest one. Um, and for more information on all of this, you can contact me at a later date, obviously. And it's also on our website, which is where you can find us. Um, this website will be up I think through October, there's a new website coming later this fall. It will have all the same information, um, plus a little extra. But from our website, you can download um, sample request forms. Uh, you can see our policies and procedures for sampling requests and other things. Um, all our facilities are listed here, as well as the charges, this year's current charges. 
And you can search our collection, most importantly, through the Index to Marine and Lacustrine Geologic Samples, which I will be talking about in more detail later on in the presentation. Uh, so that's it for me. Okay. And I guess I'm going to pass it on now to Oregon State. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. My name is Maisie Chesapee. I'm the chief curator at the Oregon State University Marine and Geology Repository, or OSU MGR for short. The OSU MGR is located in a 33,000 square foot facility, two miles southwest of the main Oregon State University campus in Corvallis, Oregon. As you can see, we are the only NSF funded geological sample repository on the West Coast. As I said, I'm Maisie Chesapee. Um, Dr. Joseph Stoner and Dr. Anthony Coppers are the co-directors of the facility. Val Stanley is the curator of the Antarctic Core Collection. And Kara Fritz is also a cura uh, curator at the MGR and our education and outreach coordinator. Rupert Minette, who is not pictured here, is our software engineer. And we are in the process of hiring a rock, cu a rock curator. Here's a slide showing the complete OSU MGR collections. The marine geology and geophysics collection comprises of cores from over 6,600 core sites. The Antarctic core collection, which was previously housed at Florida State University, includes cores from over 7,370 core sites. Together, the collection covers 24 miles worth of ocean sediment cores, a vast majority of which are maintained in our 11,000 square foot refrigerator. Our entire dredge collection comprises of more than 14,600 rocks, as well as the curation of 365 rocks from 187 <clears throat> NOAA ROV dive samples. With all the collections combined, we distribute on average about 8,000 samples per year. <clears throat> we have an expansive track lab for non-destructive sample measurements. These instruments include four geotech systems that measure geophysical properties for both whole and split core, as well as high resolution line scan imaging capabilities for split core. Our instrument suite also includes a Cox analytical iTrax XRF scanner. This next slide highlights some of our additional instrumentation, including CT scan capabilities and partnership with OSU Veterinary Hospital. The analytical instruments housed at the MGR have associated fees and users can be trained to run samples themselves. The facility also contains a large core lab with six sampling stations, providing plenty of space for descriptions and sampling. This lab contains many microscopes and supplies for making smear slides. You can see in the back of the room, we also have a mobile coralizer display station. This software is used to visualize sediment cores and associated data. We have hosted large groups of up to 15 people for sampling parties at the MGR. All this information can be found at our website, which also provides a searchable map of our collections. This map links to available data sets, including metadata, coring data sheets, core descriptions, images, and MST data. We also host virtual and education outreach resources. Please visit our website to learn more about our policies regarding sample distribution, accession of samples, instrumentation fees, for example. Also feel free to reach out to the curators. We are here to help you from curation best practices on your research cruises to sampling strategies. We can inform you on the condition of cores and rocks, how much material is left in cores and rocks, and any potential issues that may have occurred during collection that could affect your request. Thank you. Thanks, Maisie. <laughs> uh, next, we'll turn it over to URI. I don't know if that's Becca or 
It's me, it's Becky. <laughs> Hi, I'm Becky Robinson from the Marine Geological Samples Lab at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I'm the sort of co-curator with Katie Kelly um, here at URI. She sort of handles the hard rock and, and I do the soft. And so here is a um, one place where our website is listed. I, I listed it below also. So um, our repository um, hosts collections um, that originated as GSO Marine Geology and Geophysics faculty and staff. Um, and has expanded um, to include um, sort of uh, collections from other investigators as well as the collections of the um, exploration um, vessel Nautilus. And we welcome samples um, from anyone. So we are um, sort of housed in a approximately 6,000 square foot um, building, which is uh, small compared to some of the other repositories. Um, with a 10,000 cubic foot refrigerated storage for cores that's had to have been expanded out to um, these refrigerated vans. So um, alongside uh, Katie and I, we have one part-time curator, Danielle Karras, and um, two full-time graduate students. One is funded by um, the National Science Foundation and the other is by the University of Rhode Island. And we generally have one to two undergraduates that are also um, working in the repository. Our holdings include sediment cores, rock dredges, sediment grabs, ROV grabs and push cores, as well as volcanic island sub and continental margin subaerial, um, mostly volcanic rocks. And so you can see the distribution of our holdings um, by type in this map. Um, and so I'll, I'll elaborate a little. Um, so in terms of the sediment core collection, we have uh, just under 2000 piston gravity box and ROV push cores um, housed in our refrigerated storage, storage as well as um, we have um, a fairly large number of um, lake or continental drilling program cores and U channels that need to make their way back to lock core. And we are working intensively with them to do that, um, but we're also making some of those samples available or by request during this process. So if you are looking for um, lake cores, we may have some of them that are kind of in limbo right now. We've got um, sort of just under 1200 rock um, dredges, which include, which sort of make up one of the most extensive collections of volcanic rocks from the mid-ocean ridge. About a quarter of the global ridge system has been sampled on average with an interval of about 40 kilometers. And with this um, extensive mid-ocean ridge basalt collection um, comes a, a pretty fantastic sub-collection of glass separates from submarine lavas, not only from our holdings, but from holdings from other repositories. This um, is a legacy of Zhangi Schilling. So we call it the Schilling Seafloor Glass Collection. And um, it's mostly glass separates from individual um, pillow lavas, but there are also some um, thin sections and other materials. Um, the parent um, rock, like I said, may be in our collection or archived in another repository. And um, maybe more importantly, is that much of the geochemical data for the glass collection is available. Um, we have um, a, a lot of it that's sort of a mixture of published and unpublished. And so Katie, um, can make the data available in full by request, but also um, you can look in um, a G-cubed um, article by Katie and colleagues that highlights a lot of this glass collection. And the link is, or the information for that is here. Um, so we, we have this dry um, dredge storage. Um, the dredge halls are stored in plastic canvas or um, burlap bags. And then the database um, stores their locations for e easy retrieval. And I say easy, but rocks are heavy, it turns out. Um, and our current rack system is about 90% full. And you might see this theme moving through the repositories. I think um, uh, Nicole mentioned it also. So we are the designated repository for samples collected um, by the Nautilus program. 
Um, all the samples are accessioned, assigned IGSNs, and are made publicly available. Um, and this is really important because a lot of people don't know that these are um, available through us. And so here is the um, exploration vessel Nautilus, which is run by the Ocean Exploration Trust and, um, and some of the ROV grabs and push cores. Um, and then finally, we have these volcanic island and continental margin subaerial samples. Um, and these are mostly from acti active volcanic regions in the Western US, Italy, Mexico, Chile, Lesser Antilles, Indonesia, Iceland, Greece, and the Aleutians. And so these are also um, available uh, upon request. Okay, so how do you request samples? Um, the link to our website is um, listed here at the top and, and on our website um, are links both to IMLGS where our um, samples are listed um, through their viewer and Nicole will walk people through finding samples on IMLGS in a minute. And then um, another place um, which is linked on our website is, um, is Rolling Deck to Repository, R to R. And so it, it, we've coordinated with R to R so that you can um, search on a cruise. So if you know the cruise from which um, you're looking for samples, you can search on that cruise. And then when you, when you get to that cruise, you can scroll down a little bit to cruise data at other systems. And um, the first remote system is listed as CSAR, System for Earth Sample Registration. And you can learn more about CSAR by clicking this link, or you can scroll or move over to the side to the samples link. And by clicking on this, it will take you directly to the sample data for the cruise that you're looking for. And so this is a, um, for any cruise that's listed in R to R, this is a really great um, way to find samples. So if you want to get samples from us, once you've found them either on IMLGS or CESAR, um, you can go to our website and under samples, we have um, a request samples button that will link you to a sample request form. Um, you fill this in with the important data that we need and we will get an email and be able to um, fulfill your request as soon as possible. We have sample prep facilities, large and small slab rock, uh, saws, core splitters, prep and picking labs, lots of petrographic and picking microscopes, um, in section prep, sample preparation, crushers, ball mills, grain size analyzer, description and sampling tables, as well as um, an MS, a geotech MST with line scan um, core imaging available um, for use from um, the lab next door. And we also, um, as part of our mission, conduct educational and outreach activities. And so the core lab at the MGSL doubles as a teaching lab for some URI courses, including um, the geological oceanography course and courses for ocean engineering. And we run facility tours and, ha and hands-on interactions with elementary K through 12, as well as undergraduate classes and visitors to um, the Graduate School of Oceanography. There's a really nice um, ship to shore processing rock samples and sediment cores video that um, Nautilus Live from the Ocean Exploration Trust um, uh, prepared for, uh, um, for their use really, but it's available on YouTube um, or through the Nautilus Live website. Um, and it's about seven minutes long, too long to show here, but um, if you're interested or you wanna show something to a classroom, um, this is a, is a really nice, very well-produced video. And here's just a nice shot of Katie um, doing some outreach um, with a nice volcano demo. So um, thanks for your time. So we are an archive, a community resource, a working lab, and a launch pad for research, outreach, and education. Hmm. Thanks, Becky. Uh, and then we'll pass it on to Hui. All right, everybody see this? Um, so my name is Nicole Donchamont. I'm the curator here at the Seafloor Samples Lab. Um, we're at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution um, in Woods Hole, Mass. 
Um, so first I'll start off and uh, kind of give you a brief overview of what exactly we are. Um, so we're an NSF funded repository. Um, this number uh, 14,000, we have over 14,000 archived marine geological samples it includes sediment cores, rock dredges, coral cores, surface grabs, and samples collected by submersibles. Um, we also have uh, shells and some other things that aren't listed here. Um, our goals, oh, sorry if you hear a, a snoring dog, um, I've got one of those. <laughs> Um, so goals are to facilitate education, research, um, and science. So basically, um, we're here to help. Um, so some of the services we provide, um, sample curation and analysis. We ensure that samples are properly curated, preserved, um, and disseminated. We also have some analytical capabilities in-house. Uh, planning. So if you're planning a cruise, like everyone else has mentioned, um, talking to us before your cruise versus after is uh, a lot better. Um, or if you're thinking about retiring, um, we also will help you bring in your collection. So we will work with you to bring your collection into the repository. And the third thing we do is education and outreach. So we provide tours uh, to the facility to interested parties. That's uh, K through 12 to just interested members of the public. Um, who we are. So I'm a curator. My name is Nicole. Um, our director is Jeff Donnelly. We also have Mitchell Starr and Ellen Rusin. And so our facility is located on the Quisset campus um, of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, we have about half of uh, the building of McLean. And here you can kind of see a map of where our spaces are. We have dry stores, we have refrigerated areas, and we also have some sampling labs, um, including a rock saw room, a tool room, and uh, we also have a CT scanner lab as well now, and a high bay, which is used um, to help people prep for trips, um, and has a lot of tools in there as well. So our storage capabilities, we have rock racks. Um, last year, we put in uh, several new rows of racks, and now we um, have about 867 empty bins, so we can take in more samples. We are limited um, with our refrigeration space, which others have mentioned, um, 1631. This, uh, this number is now a little lower. And uh, dry stores, we have a good amount of storage there. Um, you can about uh, 16,000 more samples there and non refrigerated storage. Our working space. Um, so, right now we are, uh, we just took on the CT scanner. And that lab is now, um, that's where the sampling lab was. And so now we're also taking on a new accommodation space, which is going to be renovated. Um, we have some ovens, we're going to get some sieves, sediment sinks so people can work in there. Um, nice bench space. We also have rock saws and both the sampling space and the rock saws are available for researchers to use. Um, all you have to do is fill out a space request on our website. We have the mixed used high bay, so it's about 2,000 square foot high bay that includes a uh, hoist, um, number of uh, drill presses and hand tools, and then we have also have an iTrax XRF and a Geotech RX CT scanner. Um, so our samples, what do we actually have? So here is a table of uh, the samples that have been inventoried. Uh, these numbers are lower and they're not accurate. Um, we're doing a wall-to-wall -wall inventory of the facility. And so there are things that are constantly being added to this. Um, and yeah, how do you get samples? So there's a number of ways. Um, you've heard everyone talk about the IMLGS. Uh, we also use Cesar, and we also have um, our own in-house database, Edcore 2000. Um, unfortunately, it's on a Windows 2000 server and is no longer supported, and it's only available to people that can access the Hui VPN. Um, 
but we are always happy to help uh, if anyone has questions, uh, share that information. So here is kind of a list of um, some screenshots. You can see our samples here in Cesar, and then you can kind of see uh, Subcore 2000 right here. And then um, here people can search um, for different IGSNs or platforms or different um, environments. So um, one of uh, the biggest things we're trying to tackle right now is discoverability of samples. Um, so like I mentioned, we're doing a wall-to-wall -wall inventory and getting everything digitized. Uh, most of the cores have been inventoried, um, but we are making our way through the dredge and rock collection. Um, I talked about a database, so that kind of ties into the inventory um, and how people find samples. Uh, so we're digitizing paper records, and then uh, we've also noted that uh, people find samples through other people folks, uh, the publication. So that's really helpful and a good reason for people to send us your pubs. Um, and then IGSNs, so the unique identifiers. Um, our cores have IGSNs, we're working on the rock collection, and we're also working on labeling everything with QR codes. And so if you are to request a sample, you can go to our website, here is a Screenshot, we have a few forms on there. The first one um, shown here is a sample request form. You can fill out your information here. Um, tell us about your project, what you're looking for, uh, what you're going to be doing and why. And we can help you get sorted. Um, we basically every year um, giving out 7,800 um, samples. And most of the samples go out to outside of Hui. And so how you can use the facility, if you want to use a rock saw room or sampling space, um, you can fill out this here and it goes through if you've been trained. And if not, we can get a schedule, a date for you to be trained. Um, thank you. Here's our website link. Here is an email that you can reach a member of the repository staff where we can answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Um, are there any quick questions regarding the repositories right now? Um, if you put your hand up, I might not see it. There are five pages, which is nice. But um, so if you have a question, I would say put it in the chat and that way we'll be sure to see it and not miss it. So now we're going to move on unless there are questions. Okay, we're moving on the, to a couple of reminders for people who have used the repositories in the past. Um, oh, Henry, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> Scripps is not in the repository system. It has one of the largest rock collections and core collections in the world. What is the situation there and why isn't it? So Scripps is in the repository system. It's just not no longer funded by NSF. It is part of the index to marine and lacustrine geologic samples. Um, and I'll show you the list of all the repositories that are in that database. Um, but Scripps, they are still a functioning repository. Um, and yeah, and they are still included in most of our meetings. Um, I will say that every other year, all of the repositories are invited to a curator's meeting. Uh, this year, we had a virtual one at Scripps. Um, Alex was the host. So yeah, so they are very much involved in the repository system, so to speak, still. Um, they are just, yeah. Unfortunately, they're just not presenting today um, because of the NSF funding. Um, any other quick questions? Before I move on. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about the IMLGS um, in just a couple of minutes, I swear, I promise, in more detail. Uh, Clint Edrington 
is the new curator of the IMLGS. Um, he is in the call. So when we get to that part, if there are any very specific questions, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them if we cannot. Um, so first, let's get back to reminders for people who have used us in the past. Um, if not, this is just a notice that all of the repositories have guidelines and requirements for people who request and get samples from us. Um, one of those is to make sure to send us links to your papers when they're published. Uh, this way they can become part of our databases and Yes, the metrics help that we know how many publications came from our collection, but more importantly, they will make the usefulness um, of all of the collections that much greater by giving all of this data. Um, one of the, the biggest things in the survey, one of the main takeaways was people want published data from the material. Um, yeah, the ability to find associated publications is very helpful uh, and wanted by users. Also, we would ask, we do ask, um, that you acknowledge our facilities in your publications if you are publishing data from samples that came from our facilities. Um, that is very helpful for people reading those publications to find those samples and get more information about them as well. Uh, the other things, lots of things. Um, yes, another way is what we've all mentioned is contacting us pre-cruise or sample collecting expedition. Uh, as we all also noted, right, we have limited space. Um, so contacting us beforehand will ensure that we have space for your samples um, and also that all the metadata is properly collected and formatted. Um, proper metadata, we all have minimum requirements. The very basic minimum requirements would be um, the crews. Now I'll pull up a spreadsheet so I don't forget this. Yeah, it's basically going to be, we need the cruise, which includes the ship as well, right? So we know the ship, the cruise, the date it was collected, latitude, longitude, very, very basic stuff that you would need for your samples regardless, but we would need that information as well, right? Your water depth, um, any and all pertinent information, anything that happened to the sample shipboard, anything you know worth noting um, but yeah there are very basic requirements if they're not explicitly listed on our website we do have forms we have plenty of things we can send you if you have questions about how to ingest material into our facilities how to get material out right requesting samples it's available on all of our websites um, that sort of thing but also right be contacting us during the planning stages of your expeditions is critical for a smooth transition of those samples into our facilities. It saves everybody a lot of headaches um, in, the very, in the long run. Is there anything, anyone else, any of the other curators want to add or double down on, so to speak? <laughs> All right, I'll just keep moving along. Um, so if, Katie's ready. If there's no one else, oh, I see lots of stuff going on over here in the chat. Yes, we'll get to all of the Polar Rock repository and everybody. Um, I'll mention everybody when we get to looking at the IMLGS when we go over the survey reply responses. Um, so if there's nothing any of the other curators want to add at this point, I'd ask Katie is going, Katie Kelly's gonna show us um, a successful case study in accessioning samples from a retiring researcher. Um, but it is something that we will all do. If you have samples with proper metadata documentation, we will take them. <clears throat> so I'll turn it over to Katie. Thanks, Nicole. Um, right, so I, I wanna talk about taking rocks that you might have and putting them into our collections. 
Uh, I'm Katie Kelly. I'm Becky Robinson's counterpart at the URI Marine Geological Samples Lab. Um, one of the things I want to make sure the community understands is that we all do take donations. One of our key missions as repositories uh, is to preserve and make available marine geological samples. And these aren't strictly limited to samples collected by people at our home institutions or by our institution's ships. Most of you are not at an institution that has a repository. And so we're here though, to help you comply with NSF's data uh, compliance rules by making your samples publicly available. Placing your samples in a repository is a great way to ensure the samples and your own enduring scientific legacy by ensuring, in fact, that the samples are available, publications in the future uh, cite your work and your samples. And so it's a, it's a great thing to think about at any point in your career, but in fact, especially as you're looking forward to retirement. But if even if you're plan just planning a cruise where rock and core samples might be collected, now is the time to talk to a repository to find a place to house your samples long-term. And we have some recent experiences that just provide a few insights and tips for working with a repository to house your samples from the perspective of a donated collection. And this is a collection that Jim Gill at UC Santa Cruz donated to us. Uh, it's a beautiful collection of marine dredges and alvin grabs from the Izubonin Mariana system. Donations, I think, are more of a conversation than a stepwise process. So I can't provide you with a set of instructions for how to donate your samples. Um, but it's important to just think of it as a conversation, I think, and, it, and a conversation that can take a lot of time. Jim Gill approached me at a meeting two and a half years ago to start the conversation about contributing his rocks to our collection for long-term care preservation and service to the community. Um, it can take a long time to go from talks to rocks. And so this is one of the reasons why it's important to think about it sooner rather than later. If you're not sure where's the best home, who should you talk to? Um, is your collection really eligible for donation? You should just reach out to any of us at any of the repositories to talk to us and we can start the process of guiding you to the best homes for your samples. Sometimes it may even be more than one place. Uh, and maybe it makes sense for some of your rocks to go to a repository that already has a rich collection in that same area or the same sample type. For example, the coral cores at Lamont, that, that seems like a, you know, a, a kind of centralized place. Um, we have a draft of a checklist that we can share with any prospective donors that can help to get this conversation going. It's basically, I have a kind of screenshot of it to the right here, it's small print, but um, I can provide this to anyone who's interested as a way to help you sort of think about the scope of your collection, what you might want to donate, just to get the conversation started. In the case of Jim Gill's collection, this was 329 samples collected by dredging and Alvin Dives, and the map shows their distribution roughly throughout Izubonin and Northern Mariana systems. Many, but not all of these samples had been previously published on, which made their value really wonderful. Um, these also, many had IGSNs already assigned, linked to an EarthChem data library that had all the geochemical data. And while Jim is really fantastic in sort of setting a model for how the community should do this, um, this isn't necessarily the standard by which you should all be held. Having IGSNs already assigned to the rocks is really helpful to us because it means that the minimum metadata requirement is probably already met. But um, linking to geochemical data, which helps link to publications, that adds value to the collection that helps all of us out. In Jim's case, he called the collection himself on site at UC Santa Cruz before packaging up the rocks in, box, in boxes. And he did that process in consultation with us. That is, we had a long back and forth discussion about what might be worth keeping, worth uh, tossing or contributing for outreach samples and things like that before we finally settled on the final collection that came to us. 
But most helpful in that process is in the end, what did come to us came with a very complete inventory spreadsheet that contained all the sample metadata that we needed to put the rocks into our collection. And URI arranged for the final packaging and shipment of the rocks themselves, which is about a pallet, seven boxes full of rocks. And it was not very expensive. It was perfectly within our budget and scope to do this. And so if that's the kind of thing that worries you, you shouldn't let it worry you. That's again, part of the conversation with the repository is how to move the rocks. Upon receipt, our sample, those samples were accessioned very rapidly because the donor provided such an organized trove of metadata. And so these samples are now, where they arrived in June, they're now available for loan if anyone wishes to request them. They're discoverable on CSAR. Uh, and IMLGS hopefully in the near future. So just a couple takeaways. It helps the repository, the community and the value of the collection if it is well documented. And so those minimum metadata and even going beyond the minimum metadata is really important part of the, the process of moving your samples to a new location. Priorities for preservation include, I mean, repositories want samples that people will request, and that includes samples that are well studied, unique, or difficult to recollect. But in particular, uh, with respect to marine samples, I'd say that with the appropriate metadata, most marine samples qualify for that almost automatically. Donation takes time and effort on both the donor and the repository sides, and the same goes for samples that are coming back from a cruise. And so you need to plan for time to be invested in the, the archival and, and moving of your sample collection. We are here to help you though. And so we want to make sure everyone knows that we're available to start these conversations with you now. And that's all I have. Thank you, Katie. Um, I see in the chat that, yeah, there's more questions about databases and the IMLGS. Um, as far as a one unified database, no, there is, it's, it's coming sort of. Um, the IMLGS acts as a database for all of our collections, um, but that's just it. It's, it's a database where you can go to find and look at, you know, find samples and their locations, um, but there's no links from that database to, to the repositories themselves to request samples or that sort of thing. It's not like a one-stop shop, if you will. Um, a more centralized uh, database is sort of slowly in the works. It's in, the, it's in talks, I suppose. Funding is a key. Um, so that's one of the biggest hangups there. <clears throat> so getting back on track. Um, are there any questions about accessioning samples right now uh, for Katie or for any of us? Anyone? Okay. Oh, Henry. Oh, Henry, thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> Hello there. Um, <laughs> one of the biggest problems with accessioning samples is knowing what the material really is. And um, I have taken in recent years to imaging every rock sample I collect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This makes those rock samples available to a huge community. Mm -hmm. You can't go to a core repository and haul down 25, 40 dredge hauls from a cruise unless you're devoting a month or more to it. Mm -hmm. um, with imaged rocks, you can go through an entire collection like that in a day right. and find out what material you want. And this is essential. It's particularly essential for complex rocks. Uh, for example, metamorphic and igneous plutonic rocks, peridotites, uh, lower crust and mantle materials. And are there any plans in the works for trying to image existing collections? Yeah, yeah. We all have wish lists of things we want to get done. That includes, like, for me personally, um, during Vima and Conrad, they photographed, like all the cores were photographed um, as they were split. Um, the dredge halls, not so much. But once you have decades worth of backlog dredge halls to photograph, it becomes, you know, there's a lot of obstacles to getting that done. Um, so right now is for my case scenario anyway, as people request samples, 
I take pictures of rocks and send them. Um, but you're right, it is, it's a big thing that I would love to be able to do, but staffing is an issue. Time and staffing is, are the hurdles to that, so. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it occurs to me that if you're going to collect rocks with an NSF grant, you should image them at sea. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. now but, I think it's definitely more standard um, to do that, right? If you have a dredge hole, photograph it as it comes in could be helpful, depending on the size of it, of course. You might only be able to photograph representative samples of a dredge hole, something like that right now. Um, but it should be, yeah, that would be a um, something that NSF could tell researchers to do as a matter of course, or somehow be able to help the repositories to do it if the dredge hole to wherever the, dr the dredge is going, so to speak. Um, right now at sea, we, we, we image 700 to 800 samples. Nice. Uh, yeah, truly representative. But mm -hmm. we also collect minimum basic data to describe those samples. Yeah. And it seems to me that the curatorial group needs to get together and get some sort of standardized set of information that needs to be collected along right. with the images. Um, right. And that so is a major thing that needs to be done. Right, so we do have that, like I said, since the late 1970s, the core repositories have been meeting every other year, standardizing the metadata um, with, along with NOAA, uh, right? The, uh, the IMLGS was started in the, the early 80s. Um, so as a matter of archiving, the repositories do have standard sets of information that are recorded and are collected, right? Photographs. So for sediment cores and a lot of the dredge rocks, right? It's photographs, descriptions are collected, done as a matter of archiving. Um, standard, like some data that is also done uh, for sediment cores, we run them on the geotech just to collect very minimal basic um, physical properties. Um, and then, th but that's, Mostly it. I think a couple of the other repositories might have more um, equipment that they can use and more staffing for time, but um, we do collect as standard meta, uh, sorry, data, photographs, descriptions, and then some geophysical data. That is done for all samples entering the repository. Um, as a can, I, can I add something here, Nicole? Yeah, from OSU. So, so take care. And your point is very well taken. Um, we actually are developing protocols and you know SOPs for people out at sea, you know, uh, dredging and collecting the rocks and describing them. Uh, for example, our repository is able to send out a whole photographing system that allows you to take, you know, a high quality kind of photographs to really document the rocks. We make standard uh, rock descriptions at sea that can be part of the repository and. In some smaller collections, particularly with dive samples, right, that for hard rocks, we actually make thin sections, uh, image those and also describe those. So we are working on that because I agree, there's a huge value in having the descriptions ready and handy in the database because it helps people to really see what we have and what mm -hmm. they need. Yeah, let me also add that um, we are working with UNALS to try to become a standard part of the pre-cruise planning process so that any PI who intends to go out to sea with a UNOS vessel to collect samples will talk to the repository first and go out to sea with a, basically a checklist of the kinds of metadata that are to be collected on the samples that come back to the repository. So that's a future goal. That's not something we have planned to try to implement backwards. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so let's move on to the survey responses since we're already partly there <laughs> as it is. I'm going to share my screen again and pull up the results summary. I'll make that full screen. Um, so these were the main takeaways. I'm sure there were you know, there were a lot of smaller things that were mentioned as well, like photographs being, well, that's in here, the photographs being 
you know, high priority for people. And that is totally understandable. And uh, can you, can yes. you make that much, much bigger? Oh, um, sure, sure. All the read. There we go. Is that better? Doing my screen. Okay. Um, so the first thing is the IMLGS, right? That is our main database for Lamont in particular. I think it is for several, if not all of the other repositories. Um, and like I just said, it, it's been around since the mid, at least the mid eighties, as far as I'm aware. Uh, it had one person, Carla Moore, running it for decades um, until relatively recently. Um, Kelly Stroker, who is in the, on the call, was running it, and now we have Clint Edrington running it. Um, I'm going to skip over to that right now so I can walk you through the IMLGS. So this is the landing page. Um, you can see in the lower left corner, there are several repositories listed here. Um, Nicole, we can't see that screen. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I forgot how screen sharing works. Uh, here we go. Share. Okay, is that it now? Seeing the Yes. Okay. So, sorry, here is the landing page for the index to marine and lacustrine geologic samples. In the lower left corner, you can see a list of, this is only some of the repositories that are in here. Um, I'll get to that later because there is a new app that was pushed out to the public recently um, and it has a much longer list uh, associated with it. But from here, you can search for samples from these repositories and others uh, via either searching for samples on the left, which is drop down text boxes or an interactive map. Um, I'm gonna go to the text boxes first. Uh, it really is just, you would select, no, there we go. Select a repository. You could select a specific ship, a lake, a device. Um, you can use an extended search form where you can plug in keywords to search the descriptions that are uploaded. <clears throat> uh, search samples. I'm just going to list the cruises here since there are so many samples. And scroll down here. I just wanna show you that from a core page, I just randomly went here. There is There are links here for different information right to different websites but if you click at least for the lamont collection i think it's similar for others um, if you click sample data and images at ncei you will get a list right for that core here's the core photograph that was uploaded as well as the core description um, so these things are available through the imlgs um, as well as I thought there was yeah the link to R2R and other places. But you can also search by this interactive map here, which will bring up this page. This is a much a longer list of repositories that are all in here, right? That's where all the dots are, dots and triangles and stars and what have you. Um, you can select a dot and it will tell you the crews and then the cores that are there. I haven't, I'm zoomed way out, so it's selecting a larger area. That's why there are many samples in one spot. Um, but you can do all of this in the IMLGS. Uh, it is the Lamont's only database, um, but it does link several repositories. And it's not just United States repositories. Boscorp is in there from England. Um, there are Canadian repositories as well. Uh, who else is in there? But yeah, there are even museums. Um, the Bird Polar Rock repository is in there. Uh, so these are, it's a very useful tool. Um, it's new, oh, I can't see. Can't get to that other tab. Uh, the new 
web app. Hold on, let me shrink this. So where to go? Let me move that. Let me do this. Here we go. This is their new web app that was pushed out recently. Um, it has a lot of the same functionality. So you can go to samples and do the map search here, right? From the, all the repositories. Um, you can go by cruises and you can see a long list of all the repositories uh, that are in there. But for now, I am told, since this is a quite a, uh, in, it's in production, so uh, still use this website um, for, to get to the IMLGS. And then your two search li searchable links are on the left. Um, a couple of people have also mentioned in their presentations, Cesar, which is geosamples.org. Uh, this is a service that provides a global, I, unique identifier to each sample, each subsample. So every, all the cores, all the dredges <clears throat> have or will have their a unique identifier. And then each subsample from each core and or dredge will get its own unique identifier, but will also be linked to the parent core or dredge. <clears throat> so whenever you request samples from me, um, at the end of that sampling, or hopefully very close to the when you get your samples, you will get a spreadsheet listing all your samples, as well as their unique identifier and their parent cores identifier. Um, but they all get registered here in Cesar. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and if anyone's ever concerned about um, publication status, not status, but uh, you, know, you don't want your samples to be known about before you publish, um, there is a two-year moratorium on releasing this data publicly. Just like when you, your samples, your cores or dredges come into a repository, there's a two year moratorium on those samples even going public or being able to be sampled by anyone but you and your specific research group. Um, and that's mandated by NSF policy. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, does anyone have anything else to add at this point, couriers? Otherwise. I'll stop sharing this and I will go to the new share. So we'll go back to the survey responses, um, right? The IMLGS and it is being um, kept up to date. It will be, uh, and it is not going anywhere. It is for the long haul, our centralized database. Uh, like we talked about previously, photos, yes, very important. We do do that currently on everything, but um, many of us have backlogs of things we need to get to. Like I said, I have dredges from decades and decades that were never properly photographed. So that is something that gets worked on when we can. Um, yes, Henry? Yeah, I'm sorry, I admit this a little sooner, but one of the things I'm very concerned about working on complex and limited samples is responsible sampling. Um, and a serious problem here is people would come to the collection and decide to make themselves a sub-collection from the repository, which they can use for research in future years and give to other investigators. That's a disaster because it prevents samples from being given out uh, fairly to other investigators and co-ops potential future research projects. Mm -hmm. And so one is responsible sampling and taking the minimum amount of sample required for your study and right. being respectful of other studies that might be want, someone might want to do on those samples. For example, in a, a plutonic rock, you can have myelinites, you can have several different grades of metamorphism, you can have the primary igneous petrology, you can have physical properties 
all these require specific samples, but there are no guidelines that I know of right now uh, to guide curators in uh, responsible sampling of such materials. Well, all right. Um, so I don't get many dredge requests or I'm sorry, my light is um, motion activated in here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, we do our best at preserving um, representative samples of each sample, so to speak, right? Um, and yeah, only, only sending out what is needed. Um, I have a committee of a sample request committee. So a sample request comes into me for anything. Um, I look it over and vet it, make sure what, you know, work with the researcher if the material that they want isn't available, if there's other samples that they could use, this, that, or the other thing. Um, but then it goes to a committee for approval, right? And they'll, um, they're much more in tune with, like we have someone specifically for petrology, for dredge rocks, right? So they're much more attuned to what should or shouldn't be done, that sort of thing. But we are all very cognizant of what you're saying, right? Leaving enough material um, for the future or, or for other, sample, other samples to be given out to researchers. Um, that being said though, each rock, right, is a finite sample in and of itself. So eventually it will be used up theoretically. Um, each core, we have a few cores here that were highly sampled and are basically depleted the entire core. Um, so that will happen eventually, but yes, uh, if you're talking about a, a repository like the ones um, here today, uh, we do our best to not let that happen, what you're talking about, um, that is outside of our scope. I would like to float the idea of training class for curators uh, in sampling of, responsible sampling of uh, geologic materials. So okay. that the curators have some common background. For that, you would need someone who's familiar with different types of rock samples and cores. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would create a more universal understanding of what the issues and problems are and how you should limit sampling. Okay, duly noted, thank you. Um, oh, so <laughs> derailed <laughs> a little bit here. Um, I think my thought process is, uh, so we'll get back to the survey responses. Um, share my screen again. So, uh, better links between IGSN, which is what you get from Cesar, uh, the researcher that collected the data, the data, right. Um, this item number three would theoretically be part of a, uni a more unified uh, database that we are in the works of talking about um, and hopefully we would be able to get off the ground in a few years. Um, because yes, that is a major goal of mine, even in-house. I have analog sampling forms from the beginning of the repository that were never digitized in any way. Um, scanning them is pretty much useless because it's a lot of cursive handwriting uh, that is illegible a lot of times. So um, yes, this is something that we are all working on to better make our collections that much more useful for researchers. Um, ability to find associated publications, yes, is very important to everybody. So again, part of receiving samples from us is to acknowledge that you will send us a link to your publication or at least notify us um, of its when it is published. Uh, need for edu 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 teach curatorial precision best practices. Yes, um, we are planning right educational videos for the community at large, um, and more outreach. Yes, this this town hall is hopefully the beginning of such of such a thing. Um, perhaps every two years or so we would have another one, maybe three years. Um, 
but yeah, we would definitely like to keep in touch and keep the channels of communication open between us and our users or people who might want to use our facilities, for sure. Uh, geophysical measurements, yes. They, uh, Geotech MSCL, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, a basic geotech uh, will give you density, um, P wave velocities, and magnetic susceptibility. That's the very basic geotech system. Uh, along with that, it, it will give you um, porosity and oh, I forgot what it does for the inverse of the P wave. But it does several things, and many of us run it as standard, at least for NSF-funded cruises um, and CAT scans. Yes, CAT scans or X-rays, uh, I think we all have an ability to do as well. For, for those to be collected routinely on cores, though, um, can be, you know, right, it's time and effort. Staffing is a concern for many of us. So we do what we can right now, that's what I'll say. Uh, there is no funding of policies to handle rock collections, yes. Um, again, this is what Katie was talking about to an extent, um, but yeah, NSF funding to gather those things together or some other funding for that matter um, is, yeah, is a potential roadblock to many people, but we could work with you to, um, to help in any way we can. So if you want your collection to be properly cared for and archived for future generations, contact us. That's what I would say. Contact us and we can help you get started in any way. Um, all right, any other questions on this from anybody? I'm gonna stop my sharing. Yes, all rock samples. Um, we have an extensive collection of manganese nodules here. I recently was foraging through some dredges to for some sample requests I had and found some enormous manganese nodules. I'm talking like soccer ball sized nodules that were just buried in a crate <laughs> of, of smaller nodules. So yeah, we like nodules too. So yeah, I'm gonna explain. <laughs> Um, let's see. I think the question, Nicole, was if we um, keep an archive piece of all of these things. And I think um, you basically answered that earlier. Mm -hmm. we, we try to always um, keep some in reserve, although I would say that I think glass is the first thing to go, at least yes. from our samples. Yes. Katie, can you? We never send out 100% of what we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because eventually, like analyses are going to get to the point where you can do everything you need on a tiny chip. And so we save the tiny chips. Um, we won't send those out for a bulk analysis. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're a little bit choosy when it comes to glass requests, especially if we're low on sample. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as I know, that's the end of my agenda and we're ready to open this up for general q and a's if there are any more that haven't been answered in the chat we have um one from jeff asking if we have um any protocols for what actually is curated when things come out um, from the dredge hall or um, excess of samples what is actually chosen There's oh that's come up before um and that is a, a case by case basis. Um, yeah, I, since I don't, I don't actually deal with dredges all that much. Does anyone who has more dredge experience want to take that as from the curators? Um, there is no specific protocol that I'm aware of. Um, as far as amounts that are kept. Um. Well, there's also um, there's also a fiscal limit to it, right? We, right. The well, way there's... how we the way how we actually store actually puts a limit on how much you actually can store per rock. 
-hmm. So if it's a gigantic, you know, 300 pound rock, you know, that's, that's likely not to fit on our <laughs> shelves. So that needs to be subsampled. And that typically is done at sea by the PIs. Uh, they just, they, they, they should be aware of that. I think also what Katie says, you know, currently most of our analytical techniques are such that we really don't need an awful lot of material anymore. So representative sampling is important, but I think that's the PI that actually collects the sample has a big say in that and what the portions are that needs to be, be kept in the repository. Henry, you have another one? Yeah, um, on the same subject. Mm -hmm. um, discarding material at sea is very controversial. Um, in the worst case scenario, I heard of an investigator that hauled up a big pillow with Alvin, chipped off a little piece, carried it over the side and dropped the pillow away so no one else could get some. <laughs> um, that's at the other end is Henry who keeps everything he can lay his little greasy fingers on. And there is a reason for that, which is that a long time ago, Bill Melson showed that uh, you could take a dredge hull of aphuric glasses and find that there were 15 or 20 different rock type, geochemical rock types in it. Mm -hmm. And you have to be very careful about discarding material. Um, this is particularly true for plutonic rocks because people want to keep statistics on what's been collected and found in a different spot. That's major information for the kind of studies I do. And so you have to be very careful. I, I did have a, a quarter ton rock that came up uh, that I, we knocked to pieces and distributed to everybody who wanted a piece. Um, but in general, you've got to be very careful about discarding material at sea. And you should not um, arbitrarily throw rock A and keep rock B of the same size because you, you will be throwing away, maybe throwing away a lot of valuable information. So therefore subsampling is, a, is that, that Anthony just rose is a legitimate thing that I haven't really done, paid much attention to. Um, mm -hmm. But it is important because people keep tabs on both the weight of a different type, rock type and the numbers of individual mm -hmm. rocks mm -hmm. um, because they give you different information. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm very focused on lower crust and plutonic rocks uh, where this is critical. Um, but this is an issue that needs more discussion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dredges, um, yeah. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. How does a repository become NSF funded? <laughs> um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it was that way long before I got here. So uh, I assume you just uh, talk to NSF. Uh, talk to NSF. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone recently tried to order samples from a collection that had been orphaned. Um, yes. Yes, contact us um, and we'll help you out as best we can. Yep. If it's someone else's, so the question is if it's someone else's collection, but you're trying to get it a session someplace. As long as the metadata is available, then yeah, contact one of us. Well, maybe I want to add one thing to that. I mean, I think we're also, again, we're talking about sizes. Now we can talk about the size of a collection too, right? Mm -hmm. Some of those PI collections could be relatively small and very easily uh, dealt with if, when, uh, once we start that conversation. The other ones are rather sizable. I mean, there again, you know, we need to start that conversation and we would very likely also involve NSF because you know, there's a lot of effort and resources involved with actually mm -hmm. storing a relatively big uh, collection. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, any other questions, Nicole? Well, Anne has this question about um, oh. about donated um, collections from apathetic <laughs> retirees, um, and I, I mean, I think the answer is going to always come down to if there um, if there's metadata mm -hmm. and their sort of raw, um, you know, work workable um, samples because. Without the metadata, the sample isn't um, terrifically useful to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, there's 
there's also a comment from Mo um, saying that they're going to be doing a workshop. Right. I just saw that too. Yeah. Um, and if point. we're lucky, we will we will use that as a place to make a training video. Mo, sorry. <laughs> Ambush you. <laughs> this is this is I'm on I'm on my students' uh, computer, but that would be wonderful. So our, our goal is to host this training at the OSU MDR. It's going to have a week-long pre-cruise workshop in which we train PIs on the on the utility of repositories for finding information on the um, available cores that may have been collected in the area and planning your cruise. And then there's going to be a uh, approximately 10 day long research cruise in the Ravel during which we do real sample collection and, and do training at sea for best curation practices. And then the workshop will conclude with another week at the OSU MGR during which they will archive samples and, and learn best practices for metadata handling. This is great. I was hoping somebody told you and you didn't, I didn't just ambush you. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, thanks for the opportunity and please spread the word. We're, we're looking to make a difference with this. Um, let's see. Uh, how about making a rec another comment in there? Um, PI cruise funding, uh, identify. Yeah, I think NSF does have a requirement now that you have to um, identify a repository I know I've been contacted several times to, as a collaborator and had to send, you know, sent in letters of support saying that, yes, um, we can take these samples from this cruise when it happens in X number of years, that kind of thing. Um, it's part of the data management plan when yeah. you submit a proposal to NSF. The, the issue there is that it goes to NSF that the PI has, intends to put their sample somewhere, but it doesn't. Uh, actually get communicated to the repositories when right. EIs check that box in their data management plan. Mm -hmm. So that's also something we're trying, we're working with NSF to try to fix so that we get automatically notified when those kinds of things happen. Right. Um, does that, Clint, or do you have anything you want to add about the IMLGS? Uh, sure, yes. And uh, sorry, I've been I'm on vacation, so I got a quiet room. <laughs> and I, I, I saw that Kelly, um, I think Kelly's telling thanks for, for responding to Alex. <clears throat> mm -hmm. and I would just add to that, that, um, you know, that I think, and you mentioned, um, NOAA, NCI, I've been working with IMLGS for, for decades and, and Carla, um, I haven't met Carla in person, but, um, you know, she, she did a fantastic job curating this over the years. And, um, and so I got uh, big shoes to fill, but, and so there was a gap uh, since she retired and, um, and since I came on um, relatively recently. And there's a lot, a lot of work that NCI is doing internally. Um, we've um, just um, pushed out a new web app. And, if, and it, Nicole, if you don't mind, um, cause I'm, I don't have a work computer or anything. I don't have the URL for that. Otherwise I'd put it in the chat myself, but oh, if yeah. you don't mind throwing that in the chat mm -hmm. and if uh, folks have time and you want to have a look at it, uh, please do, you know, try to break it or any feedback you want to provide <laughs> um, NCI uh, would we'd appreciate it because it's um, like you said, it's, it's in the works and it um, it's fairly nice as it is right now, but we have a lot of things we want to continue to do with it. And of course, we want to meet the needs of the community. So if there's anything that we can add, please, please let us know. Um, and yeah, so, um, and we have a you know new ingest pipeline that's, when I get back, it, it's probably going to be finished. And we have uh, several years of backlog to get through, um, which I intend to do um, as soon as everything's in place. And then, um, and then we have other things that we want to do. So we'd be reaching out to the community in the, in the near future. And I would just add a few things on which um, the four NSF curators had, had mentioned is that for us, particularly uh, NCI is, you know, we're, um, we're all digital, right? So metadata is, is critical for us. And uh, so more met metadata, metadata, more metadata, the better. And um, we also um, uh, work with, uh, um, with CSR. And so we, we, we incorporate IGSN. So that's another, another way to make your, um, you know, your sample is discoverable because we, we integrate IGSNs into the, um, into the IMLGS. 
And then, uh, and then um, I think that's all my notes I had I wanted to mention. Um, yeah, just um, if you don't mind, please, uh, you know, anyone on the call, if you have time, just ha have a look at that new web application. And um, yeah, and uh, so hopefully this time next year, we'll be, uh, we'll be in a good place to support everyone. But thanks for the time, Nicole. Thanks, Clint. Thanks. Um, all right. Uh, are there more questions? Anybody? Comments? Anything that I haven't said that I should have, curators? <laughs> um, no one? No one? Oh, Michael. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. I don't know if um, you might be interested, but I know Henry was talking about core photography. And here in the UK, we moved the entire contents of our, uh, this is hydrocarbon core, UK continental shelf hydrocarbon core. We're talking about, uh, it was 180,000 boxes, about 350 kilometers of core. And we photographed it all as we did it. Now mm -hmm. I've got a video here. Um, I don't know, would you, a couple of minutes, um, we had a semi-automatic system. So we simply swiped the barcodes and then uh, took the photographs and then the whole lot got uh, renamed um, databases updated and everything so we could do the whole um, 180,000 boxes in just over a year and a half is it possible to screen share would we be interested just a couple of minutes all right if it's just a couple of minutes sure yeah I'm curious. Um, let me just see if I can apologies this if this doesn't work ah I've lost the screen Can you, yep, are I you see. able to see this? Yep. So all the boxes of individual barcodes and we hold all the metadata in an Oracle database. So the material is brought in in pallets. Each of the boxes has got three inner boxes. So each box has got six meters of core. He takes all the boxes out, puts them in the jig on this conveyor belt. And the camera, which is a phase one camera, about 25,000 pounds worth, but really high resolution over the top. But it's all operated by, again, a set of barcodes. So when it's in place, uh, the operator here scans the barcode and that actually puts a little screen in the corner of the image. Then he just takes the photo by scanning another barcode. If the picture comes up on the screen, you can see now if that's all okay, he scans it's okay. Sometimes we did a complete audit, so we checked depths on boxes, and we have trouble, of course, in the UK with metric and uh, imperial measurements. But if there are any problems there, we could automatically co uh, correct it. And then it went through. We had to put some additional packaging in, and then they went onto pallets, and then they were transported uh, about 250 miles down to our main office in Keyworth. Oh. So um, that's it. Thanks. Well, that looks like an amazing system. If I'd I like can say, that. if anybody's interested in more, um, there is a, a video. Well, there was a video on YouTube. I don't have the link. I've it's been taken down. But if anybody is interested, by all means, uh, I'll stick my email address in the chat, yeah. and I will be very happy to share information about it. All right, thank you. Now I'm having trouble stopping <sighs> this because I can't see. Are you able to stop it for me? I've uh, lost. Yeah. Oh no, I stopped your video. Sorry, I have lost this. I've lost all the screens. There is some way I'm supposed to be able to stop your screen sharing, but I can't find it. I think if you try to share the screen, it will say stop okay. the other person. Yes, there we go. Thank you. Oh. Sorry about this, folks. I'll just go here. Okay, well, while Nicole does that, does anyone else have um, any questions or wishes? Sort of like what, what, yeah, wishes. when you think about the core repositories, what do you hope you can get from us? What kind of information are you seeking?
Anyone? Well, we're all doing a perfect job. Yay, us. <laughs> Well, um, well, we, you now all have, I will be, this is being recorded. Um, I will find a place to put it online and then share a link with everybody who wants it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, yeah, if you have any questions about the repositories, about what we can do for you, what we offer, what you would like to see, just contact us. Our emails are readily available um, and we're happy to answer your questions. So if there are no more questions or comments. Well, let's give a big thank you to yeah. Nicole you oh. uh, for setting up the <laughs> Zoom and kind of running things today. This was really great. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad it all went well. As a first time, this was great. And um, yeah, hopefully we have, we'll get together. We'll do this again um, in a couple of years or sooner if there is a desire to. But yeah, we'll definitely want to keep these lines of communication open. So um, yeah, feel free to contact us. And uh, yeah, I would say if you haven't filled out the survey yet, survey. please do because that's still information that we will use um, as we as we move forward. We're gonna we're gonna revisit all of those responses because more came in since we um, were last able to discuss them as a group. Mm -hmm. Is that it? All right. There's the survey link. Just went up in the chat. Yeah, and I'll try and figure out how to share the text file of the chat in case anyone wants that as well. Uh, so, all right, without further ado, then I'll uh, sign off. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.